Thank you for, uh, for having me. I'm going to launch right in because I only have eight minutes. Um, I'm going to tell you um, an unhappy, a little bit of an unhappy story and then a happier one at the end. Um, this is a great thing to bear in mind whenever we're talking about the past and the present towards Santayana. Well, I want to go back to the late 1800s when the term eugenics was coined by this man, Francis Galton. And roughly speaking, eugenics means the noble birth or the true seed. Um, and he really meant that because this came from a book that he wrote in 1863 called Hereditary Genius, where he traced genealogies of old families in Great Britain. And he determined that achievement was inherited talent, intellect, being a barrister, being a lawyer. And this was his own heredity here, and all those black uh, boxes are superior people that were in, was in his own family. And he was re related uh, to Charles Darwin, who did the theory of evolution, and he was also related to the Wedgwood family that made the beautiful uh, ceramics in Great Britain. Well, here was his definition that becomes a little more worrisome. Eugenics is a study of agencies under social control that improve or impair the racial qualities of future generations, either physically or mentally. Now, in Galton, and particularly in Great Britain, they were mainly concerned with sort of improving themselves. You could call that sort of positive eugenics. Be careful about who you marry and how the families are arranged. And when eugenics came to the United States, there was still that sort of positive brand of thinking, which is what can the ordinary individual do to pass their genes on in a good way, to have better offspring, brighter offspring, more fit offspring, and so forth. And we even had contests in state fairs. This one was in Kansas in about 1920, where families would submit uh, mental tests, physical tests, they would submit all this information, and judges, those are the people around the edges here, their doctors and geneticists, would choose the best families. And here was the governor's trophy for the fittest family, those four lonely people in the middle. <laughs> and then uh, if, you won the, if you won this prize, you would get this medal, which has a, I just realized the saying from one of the Psalms, which is, yay, I have a goodly heritage. And this classical man and woman are pouring the pure water of heredity into their child's cup. Well, that was fine. But then these two gentlemen were at the forerunner of my institution, Cold Spring Harbor Laboratory. It wasn't called that at the time. But together, Harry Laughlin and Charles Davenport founded in 1910 the Eugenics Record Office. It did some of those great things, like helping to basically match people up and get better mates. They did a lot of that. Uh, Charles Davenport was very interested in human beings and how they inherited different things. So if you all remember in high school or college that you learned that dark colored eyes are dominant over light colored eyes, or more or less brown eyes are dominant over blue, that was worked out by Charles Davenport and his wife Gertrude in 1908. So, you know, he did some good things. He did other, some other good things. But they founded this institution, like mini institution, still there uh, on Route 25A. And this was the eugenics record office. Um, what I need to quickly tell you is that eugenics became a science. It was taught in schools, such as here's eugenics courses that were taught at the University of Pittsburgh. It was a normal thing that you could take if you were studying biology. Uh, the eugenicists did a lot of things that other scientists do, such as having symposia and congresses. This was a famous one held at the American Museum of Natural History in New York in 1932. Uh, and they had exhibits and so forth. So, pretty much what scientists do today. Well, I want to tell you about the major thing that has something to do with race that the eugenicists did here in the United States, with a lot of leadership coming from Cold Spring Harbor. The period of 1900 to 1924 was the largest period of immigration in US history. Every year, between 800,000 and 1.2 million people came into the country legally. Here are some of them represented. You've heard of the American melting pot. Well, this was the origin of that. 
they came on ships like this, and they landed at Ellis Island in New York Harbor. They would stand in line, they'd have their documents checked out in the Great Hall, and eventually they'd be admitted into the United States without many strings attached. You had to have a little money, you had to have someone to claim you, and you couldn't have any serious communicable diseases, and that was about it. And this is what many of them got, which was Lower Manhattan during that time. Well, Laughlin and other eugenicists didn't like the complexion, you could say, of the people who were coming into the country at that time. Mm -hmm. The sort of Anglo-Saxon founding people from Northern and Western European were replaced by mainly people from Southern and Eastern European with large numbers of displaced Jews as well. Laughlin didn't like these people, and the eugenicists didn't much like them either, so it was certainly a form of racism. Um, and he testified three times before Congress to basically say that the immigrants coming into that country at that time had high rates of crime, high rates of disease, high rates of degeneracy, high rates of social, um, requiring social services, social inadequacy. <clears throat> and on the strength of this testimony, to a large extent, Congress passed the Johnson Immigration Act of 1924. And what it did was to cut immigration down to 10 or 15 percent of what it had been previously. And cunningly, it cut off immigration from Southern and Eastern Europe, basically by setting quotas of the proportion of those populations as they had been in 1890. Now, in 1890, there weren't many Lithuanians here, there weren't many Poles, there weren't many Greeks. There were lots of people from uh, England, Scandinavia, and Germany. So by using cunning statistics, by setting quotas that reflected an ancient US, they effectively cut off immigration. And unbelievably, those levels of immigration were not regained for 50 years. So that's what policy to restrict immigration can do in the long run. It's an interesting period of time that we find ourselves in now, so you can reflect on that. Well, let's go to the hopeful story now. <laughs> well, how many minutes do I have? Three? <coughs> Two. Two. Okay. Well, the eugenicists, <laughs> and, uh, you know, at that time in the early 1900s, people thought of race in a much different way than we do. They thought of each nationality basically being a different race. So they thought of race sort of in the way we think of ethnicity plus the country you came from. So basically every country was a race. And here's a book from that time that shows, quote, races of human beings. And there, a lot of them are just countries, actually. Well, here's the thing I want to say to end. Every one of us in this room and every person on this planet has a common ancestor in Africa 150,000 years ago, according to science and genetics. That's an ancient human going back even further on the, on, in Morocco, 300,000 years, as old as we can go back so far. Second, the ancestors of Europeans, Asians, and Native Americans left Africa about 50,000 years ago and migrated around. And here's roughly how they went. Third, any two people in this room share about 99.9% .9 of their DNA. In other words, between you and the person next to you, there's one-tenth of 1% 1 of genetic dif dis uh, difference on average. Now, compare that to a corn plant. These are, quote, races of maize. They all come from central Mexico and South America. They have between 5 and 10% genetic dis differences between any two of them. Now, those are real races, not one-tenth of 1%. And finally, these physical differences that we see around the room, or that you could say are race, make up just a tiny amount of the genetic differences that we have. It's just a handful or two of genes that determine hair texture and color and eye color and skin color. And they came about for one reason only, because as we left Africa and populated different areas of the world, 
we had to adapt to those con conditions that we found. So, you can now think about the differences between these races or anything you want to call a race and understand that biologically, there's very little difference between any two human beings. Mm -hmm.